Hey, it's Alex from Board Game Co. over here, and today we have another collection update. But not one where I tell you the game's leaving my collection. Instead, for the first time on this channel, just because I haven't gotten around to it yet, I will be talking about the 22 games that I have added to my collection in the first half of 2020. Now, if you've watched my collection update videos where I regularly show you all the games I'm trading away every once in a while, or here and there, I'll tell you about the games I like, the games that I enjoy, but I don't actually, or at least I haven't yet gone over the games that stay because there aren't as many. While I might get rid of 10, 20 games as a shot in my monthly collection update videos, I'd keep far fewer games. The ones, I, I'm a big fan of rotating the collection, get things in, try them out, see if they're for me. The gems, or at least the gems for me, will stay. And the rest will, will move on to, you know, greener pasture, someone else's collection to give them a shot. So in six months of 2020, six months of trying new games, there are 22 that have made it. Now to be on this list, there are two requirements. The first is it had to be a game that I played after 2020, meaning I played it in the first half of 2020 and have since kept it. And two, I have to believe there's a reasonable chance that it might stay. Meaning a game that I just played once and I still feel it needs more plays, perhaps not. Although a game that I played once and I love will definitely be on this list. So, with all that, with that disclaimer aside, let's jump into the smallest game on the list, which is Circle the Wagons. Circle the Wagons is a tiny little card game by Button Shy Games. I got this after really enjoying Sprawlopolis. Sprawlopolis is a, is a solo, single player, tile laying, card laying game where you have multiple challenges as you try to build your city. It can be played two player as well, but I prefer it solo. Button Shy is kind of the reverse. This is a two player drafting game, can be played solo, I prefer two players. Using a similar mechanic of overlaying cards on top of one another, you're going to be playing the cards onto the board, slowly laying them in different ways to accomplish different objectives. They are essentially, to me, two halves of the same coin. Both of them have variable objectives, cards, and overlaying cards. One's better with solo, one's better with two, at least in my opinion. But overall, I really, really enjoy this game. I really like it. it is, I'm a huge fan of this one. I've played it a good 20 plus times in 2020 so far. I, I I don't know. I really Button Shy has a few games that I've really enjoyed playing and there's a bunch more that I now want to try, although I do believe Sprawlopolis and Circle the Wagons are their best rated. From there we have Doppelt So Clever or Twice as Clever. Twice as Clever is the sequel, the follow-up to Ganshan Clever or That's So Clever. Ganshan Clever is a roll and write game in which you are filling out, you're filling out all these different things on these cards, you're going to roll dice, pick those dice, and then you have these interweaving boards where as you fill, as you pick a die and assign it to one of the color areas, you're going to slowly but surely unlock interweaving bonuses that start staggering. So the first half of the game kind of ends with this, you know, who's going to do what? Are we going to be able to accomplish our objectives? It's hard to know. But then as you get to the second half of the game, all those bonuses start cascading and suddenly what you do on one chart ricochets over to the next one and suddenly you ricochet over to the next one and back and forth and you have these bonuses cascading off of one another and you have these cool phenomenal turns that just make you feel powerful. <clears throat> Twice as clever, takes that same design, keeps the core mechanisms the same, you just have slight differences to the actual areas in the board that you're playing with, but it does the same thing. I still prefer Ganshan Clever for right now, I still prefer the original for right now, but I do like the sequel and want to keep giving it more plays. From there we have Watergate. Watergate is possibly my favorite two-player game, just looking all around me, all these games around here, is possibly my favorite two-player game I've added to my collection in 2020. Watergate takes that typical, not typical, but the card mode or whatever of the card-driven story mode that you get in Twilight Struggle in... 1960 and a whole bunch of other games where you have uh, asymmetric players fighting head to head using cards for both events as well as specific actions or a number of actions you'll get and you play those with a, a greater overarching story behind you. Now in Watergate that overarching story is the Watergate scandal. One player plays as Nixon trying to you know, shut down all the uncovering of evidence and whatnot. And then the player plays as the press, trying to connect those pieces of evidence, trying to show who did what and connect that to that, those, you know, pieces of evidence to see who did, to see if you can nail down Nixon. Now, in this game, I love the... I, I don't know, I love the push and pull. Ultimately, this game is tug of war, but it's tug of war that works. It's tug of war that really lets you have the opportunity to respond to what your opponent is doing in ways that are 
simultaneously just essentially undoing your opponent's move every turn, but it's so much more than that. It really allows for clever card play, clever planning, a lot of opportunity to hedge off of what your opponent's doing. It is possibly, not possibly, it is my favorite two-player game that I have played in 2020. From there we have Coffee Roaster. Coffee Roaster is a single player game, one player. It is a game that I heard a lot of buzz about this, but I kind of, I mean, when it's initially it was harder to get because it was just a Japanese import, and then Stronghold Games took it, produced it, and it, I mean, I haven't seen the original, but I like the art in this, I like the components, overall it does a great job. It is effectively a bag building game where you're trying to roast the ideal cup of coffee. It is a game which, as you go through each step of the game, you are slowly but surely developing your bag. You are taking these, these coffee beans and roasting them to the desired level so that when you're finally ready to brew your cup of coffee, you can do so knowing that you will likely get the result you want. You will likely get the perfect coffee with the perfect flavor textures, the perfect amount of roast level. It gives you these objectives and the opportunity to slowly turn your bag from a bunch of nothing into what you need. It allows for a surprisingly clever play considering what you actually are doing in this game. It allows for enough interesting and nuanced decisions that you really feel in control of your bag, but not so in control that you can get exactly what you want, but enough control that when you brew that perfect cup, when you get that perfect flavor score, you feel so rewarded for everything you did. And it takes time, it takes multiple plays under your belt for you to develop this. It's not something that you play once and it just works out. You really have to fine tune what it takes to build that perfect bag. And then when you're done with that, up into the next level because the roasting levels and the roasting objectives get progressively harder and harder and it is immensely satisfying, just like coffee itself. From there we have Taverns of Tiefenthal. I'm sure I'm saying that incorrectly. It would not be a board game co-video if I didn't mispronounce something. Taverns of Tiefenthal, 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 Tavern, the, 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 I left out the word the. The Taverns of Tiefenthal. This is a game that I heard a lot of good things about, and I, I wasn't so interested in getting it at first because it was coming off of, from the same, it's coming off of Quacks of Quedlinburg, and Quacks of Quedlinburg was a game that I enjoyed but didn't love. I didn't buy into the hype as much as other people seem to appreciate it. And Taverns of Tiefenthal, I will say, I like it a lot more than Quacks of Quedlinburg. It has deck building in while you're trying to serve all these patrons in your bar and manage different aspects of your economy and your beer supplies it works surprisingly well it has four modules inside the core game I have played with three of those four modules. I think I just need to give the fourth one a shot. Overall, the modules add enough to the game that I appreciate and like them. The game does allow you to feel rewarded. I don't know the long-term sustainability of this in my collection. It likely will depend on expansions. I really enjoy the engine they have going on. I really enjoy the deck building, but the modules to me feel like they're really just part of the game and not so much stuff that I would play without to begin with. And it does lack a little bit of the variability that I would like to keep it fresh and interesting. Already, like, I have, I don't know, somewhere in the range of five plays, and already I'm starting to feel like it's the same game every time. That being said, it has so far been a good game for each of those plays. And for right now, it's staying in my collection. For right now, it's a game that I have thoroughly enjoyed. From there we have, oh my gosh, reaching here. We have Marvel Champions, which I will avoid standing too much on its head because of all the cards inside. Marvel Champions is a game that I believe my first play was the first week of January. It was a... This is a game that I, again, I held off for a bit because... I try to avoid new hot stuff, especially new especially new hot stuff based off of IPs that are well loved. Because to me, that's just a prime setup to be disappointed. It's a prime setup to see the hype of other people who like Marvel, who like LCGs. And I just held off. And then I, I remember watching a Man vs. Meeple video where I think three of the four of them listed this as their number one game of 2019. And I was like, well, I mean, of course people can be wrong, of course people can have different opinions, but I gotta give it a shot now. And so I went out, I got a copy, and I struggled with it at first, I wasn't sure if it was a game I would keep, but the more I played it, the more I enjoyed it. I will say I do not like it as a 3 or 4 player game at all, I am tolerant of it as a 2 player game, but my preferred mode for this game is really solo, I just love you know, playing out those cards, not worrying about the fact that it is not thematic, it is ultimately math. It's math in a, you know, Marvel Universe with card play and whatnot. And playing it two-player or playing it more, it really struggles because you don't get that feeling of really 
what's going on in your opponent's turn. You don't really feel rewarded as they continue to play cards. Rather, as a single player game, I like it a lot. It lets you feel clever. It lets you give you a lot of card combos that really work well together. And you build a deck. You build a, build a Black Panther deck and just, just destroy your opponent. I enjoy Marvel Champions a lot. It is one of my favorite solo games to pull out just because of how accessible it is. It's a theme I like. I can get a game up running, set up running and finished in half an hour. And, you know, I'll keep any of the expansions because Doctor Strange and Black Widow and fun characters that I love in a Marvel Universe I really appreciate. I never really got into Legendary, the original Marvel card game, and I tried it a few times, did not like it any of the times I tried it. Marvel Champions, though, I am really enjoying. From there, let's grab from under the table, we have Silver and Gold. Silver and Gold is a not a roll and write, but a flip and write. It's a game where you have these Tetris shapes. I don't know how much you can see over there. You have these Tetris shapes on cards. It's a polyomino game, and you're going to flip over one Tetris shape after another, trying to fill in those polyominoes on the cards you're doing. You have, these are cards are you can just write, wipe, write directly on the cards and wipe those cards off with whatever eraser you have or whatnot. And it is, it's far from my favorite roll and write, flip and write, and whatever. In fact, this might be the among the least favorite from those that I still own. But it is so easy to get to the table, and it somehow manages to be rewarding. It is. It plays in 15 to 20 minutes. I can pull it out quickly. I can teach the game in three and a half minutes to you. And every time I play it, it's just fun. It's, it's relaxing. It's the kind of thing you do at the end of a long day. You just scribble a few things, scribble a few things, one after another. Continue to do that while having fun. I like this game for what it delivers. It is an enjoyable experience and it has made its way to one of the 22 games in my collection or on this list that are in my collection. From there, let's go to Chinatown. Chinatown is uproariously fun. It is such an incredible experience. It is basically comes down to five players, ideally five. We played with four. I recommend five. It comes down to five people yelling at each other for a good hour and a half until you are drained, until you are just straight up exhausted. Chinatown involves... It, it takes place over five or six rounds. I haven't played in a few months, but it takes place over a bunch of rounds in which one by one you're slowly going to buy up both the opportunity to build shops as well as the opportunity of where to build those shops. So what is ultimately is happening in this game, it's basically almost akin to Monopoly, not really Monopoly, but it has this aspect of trading. You're trading both the shops that you want to build as well as the locations you want to build in to develop monopolies and get the most profitable shops. Which means every round, as soon as you've gotten what you're going to get randomly dealt or whatnot, you then proceed to yell and scream and barter and negotiate for the next hour and a half while you convince your opponents, no, you have to give me that deal, no, I need this, no, this will be a mutually beneficial trade, no, this will not be, no, you can't possibly trade that to him, he'll win the game, no, what if you do this, then she'll do this, and how it involves yelling and screaming, and it's absolutely amazing. It is so much fun to play. I would argue it might be more fun to watch. This might be one of those few games, I haven't actually watched it, I've only played it, but it might be one of those few games that is more fun to watch people yelling at each other than it is to actually play. Whatever it is, it is mentally exhausting, it is mentally draining. It's the kind of game I want to pull out only like twice a year, but those twice a year, th those will be amazing experiences. Not for the gameplay, but just for the fun of yelling and screaming and negotiating. From there, let's go to Lorenzo El Magnifico. Lorenzo El Magnifico is one of the many games I've been getting as I slowly but surely started to play all these games by... There's a five or six Italian designers that do a bunch of games that I really appreciate. I really like them all. I believe my first one was Coimbra, which is actually one of the later releases. But then I slowly started to make my way through them to try to see which ones were for me, which ones weren't. Lorenzo El Magnifico, while not my favorite, is... A thoroughly enjoyable game. It is a game that it has many elements that are very similar to Coimbra. I believe many people say they prefer Lorenzo, that they, that Lorenzo is the, the original and the better game. For myself, I prefer Coimbra, but it basically comes down to just a lot of tight game mechanisms, a lot of tight decisions that you're trying to do a bunch of different things and you're only going to be able to do so many so well. You have to pick and choose where to put your resources, where to put your time. You have to choose which charts you want to develop, which card tableaus are going to be most rewarding based on the strategy you are pursuing. It has elements of worker placement, elements of just resource management while you try to desperately do everything you want while knowing in advance you will never be able to do everything you want. It is 
an incredibly tight game. I do want to get my hands on the expansion at some point to give that a shot. For right now, like I said, I prefer Coimbra, but I do really like Loren Lorenzo El Magnifico, and this is one of the games I've added to my list in 2020. From there, let's go to Mandala, which may be the most recent edition. I think so. I'm just looking around over here. Mm, I think this is the most recent addition to the list. Mandala is a game that I've played it five, six times already, but all in one day. I basically pulled it out, played it, and played it again, and played it again, and played it again. It is rewarding. In this game, it's one of those typical two-player game boxes like this. In this game, you are basically going to be drawing cards with different designs. There are six different designs, and they can go in, I believe, six different areas on the board. It's, I think so. I think it's six different areas. But those cards are going to go to different areas, either becoming the, the cards that you're going to fight over, or alternatively being utilized to lock in the majority of those areas. So they're just designs. All they are is colored cards, but where you play them defines what they are. And then there's two different mountain areas, and again, in each area, you can either play it to become something you fight over, or you can play it to lock in who wins what you're fighting over. And it is simultaneously ridiculously simplistic, and yet it is so rewarding, and each play has become increasingly more... I don't want to say it becomes more deep, but you understand more about what's happening, how this game is played, how you have to combat each other to actually win. It is just colored cards. I'm still surprised that they developed a game around this, but it's it works. It really, really works well. As you acquire cards, they will bo go both for scoring as well as to determine the value of scoring, which means the order you get cards in can be incredibly significant. And it's not about getting the most cards, cards. it's about getting the right cards at the right time. If you properly stagger your endgame scoring, you can walk away with a handful of cards that are worth more than all your opponent's cards put together. This is a game that requires timing, precision, understanding what is going on on the board, understanding how to take advantage of that, how to manipulate that, that board state and push your opponent into to winning one area so that you can win the area that helps you win the game. I've really enjoyed Mandala so far and I hope to keep playing it. From there we have Parks. Parks is one of the most incredible experiences I have had in 2020. Parks is a game that Wow, I, I heard a lot of good things about this game. I got the game. It was immensely satisfying to, to I guess, look at it or whatnot. I read the rules and then I kind of lost interest. The rules just didn't seem interesting to me, and I was like, oh, this must be one of those situations where people see a pretty game, rate it well, and and I did not trust the, the board game geek population. I did not trust the hype and the reviews, and I sat there and said, whatever, I'll play it and get rid of it. And then a few weeks went by, and I eventually did play it, and I just played it again, and again, and again. This game is simultaneously beautiful, simultaneously simple, and simultaneously mean, cutthroat, and rewarding. This is a game that as you are moving your hiker along a trail, and that's all you're really doing, you just move him along a trail, take the reward, move him along a tra trail, take the reward. It manages to be so cutthroat and so strategic in what you are doing while maintaining just a handful of rules, a very simple approach. I love this game. I absolutely adore this game. It might be one of, I have to look around it, it's my top five on this list. I don't know if it's my favorite, but it's definitely top five on this list. I highly recommend you get Parks. It is accessible to a variety of player types. It, it will be cutthroat. It may not seem that way, and to lighter players, to people who are just playing it very casually, it may be less cutthroat, but there's still a degree of screwage in this game that is so ridiculously satisfying. From there, let me see if I can make some room over here. From there we have Suburbia. Ugh. Now this is definitely a cheat in the sense that, and I think there's two of these on this list, two cheats. This is a game I actually played well before 2020. I played it back in the day, a long, long time ago. I don't remember exactly how long. I, I played it when I was just, when I didn't even have a game group. I just played games with my wife back then. It was just the two of us. And I enjoyed it. I liked it. But eventually I moved on from it. But it's a game I recently got back because I've slowly been re-examining some of the games I used to get rid of or I had gotten rid of well in the past to see if they were a fit now. And Suburbia is one of those that has so far made the list. We got it again. It got the giant big box collector's edition. We have played it and we have enjoyed it. It is a game that, while it may not have been as good as I would have liked a two-player, and I think it actually is rated well a two-player. I just, or maybe our taste just changed. I don't really know. But it, it is there's enough strategy in there to be rewarding. It's simple enough to be just a fun 
pull a tile, play it, have fun, see how you can maximize. The mathiness of the scoring is still annoying and still tedious. I know some people recommend the app. I always hated the app interface. I can never get into it. But I do like this game. I do enjoy it. I am uncertain about the shelf life of this game. Sometimes with the games that I get back especially, I find that... It, I play it a few times and then sometimes I remember why I got rid of it in the first place. But for right now, I'm enjoying it. For right now, it is a game that has been added to my list in 2020, and that is why it is on this list. From there, oh, we have Barbarians the Invasion. Barbarians the Invasion is a... If this is from a small publisher, I don't even know who it's from. I can't find their name. But... It is a smaller publisher. It is a game that... I shouldn't be tilting it. I think things are falling over in there. Tabula Games. It's by Tabula Games. I think. Tabula something. But it's a game that I played it a few times. It is an interesting, a very interesting experience. I don't know whether it will have the legs to stay in my collection, just because it is simultaneously a game that I found thoroughly enjoyable, but also very different, also very unique, and in a way that I'm still mentally wrapping my head around. There are elements of worker placement in this game. There's elements of area control. But the the whole theme and aspect that they have this giant volcano kind of board in the middle where you move your where you, where you take these actions and then you kind of cascade down this board so it drastically changes the actions you can take as you move from the center of the board progressively lower and lower unlocking different actions along the way and people can rotate these these different levels of the volcano to prevent or help or whatever their actions either they can take hurting the actions you can take it is very dynamic very interesting it is a fascinating experience but I really, I'm having a hard time finding the words to describe this game because it is so different. But again, elements of worker placement, elements of action selection that are fascinating, elements of area control, a lot of card play in terms of utilizing your, your troops to attack different cards and get different things, a lot of challenges you have to face. It's an interesting game. I, I, again, I have a hard time putting this one into words. It's just so many different things going on in this, but I do like Barbarians the Invasion and it has been added to my collection in 2020. From there we have Monumental. And you might be confused because it depends on which of the various elements of, you know, content that you follow that I put out. Monumental is a game that I got, I liked, I got rid of, or said I was getting rid of in my last collection update video, and now I'm back to liking it. So, short version there is, I played it a few times and I enjoyed it. I did find elements of it a little too fiddly, it's a little too long, the combat is not something that I like as much as I would like to like, and so I was inclined to eventually get rid of it. But, when I said so in my last video, Jeremy Howard kindly commented, how dare you Alex, don't you dare get rid of that game, it has so much promise, so much whatever, and because I respect Jeremy Howard, I said fine, I'll give it another play. And I did. And I still am not sold that it will stay in my collection forever. But what I will say is every play of Monumental I have had has been progressively better than the last. I have enjoyed it more and more each time I played it. So that while I still have concerns, while I still have aspects of the game that I am not sold on completely, but there are the, uh, the overall gameplay I have enjoyed more each time I played it, and even elements of the combat that I've been dissatisfied with, I came up with a pretty simple house rule to potentially address. Just doesn't fix everything, but it, in my opinion, it improves it without changing anything at all. No components, no whatever, just one rule change that makes combat a little bit more punishing, and I think combat needed to be a little bit more punishing in this game. Overall, Monumental is a game system that I'm still not sure of. I have a dollar pledge on the late last uh, the last Kickstarter because I'm still debating whether I want to get more stuff or not. They're, especially those Titans. Those Titans were complete overkill. Sure, they're cool, but complete overkill. I am not sure what I will be doing with Monumental, but for right now, because it's gone through you know a phase of getting rid of, getting back, getting rid of, for right now, it does belong on this list. From there, let's shove this pile out here. From there we have a few games. Let's go through these. Actually, let's do a fun one. Now you can see a bunch of games at once. So, we have Hadara, Belfair, and Margaret of Valeria. Let's go through each of those one at a time. So, Hadara first. Hadara is, you know, now they're blocking me. So let's come through, let's do this way. Hadara first. Hadara is a game that I really like this game. I've played it only twice, so take that in mind. And I'm pretty sure all the cards are falling out because they're in this tray. I really be, should be careful when I do these videos. Just components going everywhere. No, it's no component drop from the dice tower, but in a way, inside the box is a component drop going on. Hadara is a game that I would compare to Seven Wonders. It has that element of three ages of play in which you are just slowly but surely building up your civilization in a few different ways from combat or conquest, you conquest colonies, to feeding your civilization, to uh, income, to building statues. 
It's a very simple game in which all you're doing for three different eras is drawing cards and picking which ones to sell to pay your actual bills versus buy with the money you got. And through this game you're going to level up different tracks and then there are some cards that give you special abilities that are fun and rewarding. But this game, I, I, I feel it needs an expansion. I feel it absolutely needs an expansion in order to stay in my collection forever. Because right now, while engaging, while simple, while easy, while a lot of fun, I don't feel the variability is there for me to keep it across multiple plays. For my first two plays, I've only played it twice, it has been thoroughly enjoyable. And, and it's a lot of fun to, to draw those cards and build those point scoring mechanisms and feel like you're getting a lot done. And it really does feel like you're getting a lot done. The only critique I have is the variability in the game is lacking, at least core game alone. More so than Seven Wonders, I would argue. It's just, it really is the exact same thing again and again, but still fun, still rewarding. I, I like this game a lot. Z-Man, if you're listening, I hope this sold well, or even if it didn't sell well, if you just want to do me a favor and print a whole bunch of expansions for this game, I think a few expansions, a few module, modules that mix up the game could really add a lot to this game's shelf life. From there we have Everdell. Everdell, I think Everdell, and I, I'm just holding Belfair, but I really mean the whole system. I just left the box upstairs. Everdell is a game that I think this is my favorite game that I've added to my list from this entire list. I, from the 22 games, I think Everdell is my favorite. This, Everdell is a game that is so ridiculously enjoyable. I just did a video together with Quackalope there where we covered, you know, right for you, wrong for you and Everdell. I'm guessing my video is going up before his, so we'll see what happens there. I will eventually do a full review of Everdell myself, but for right now, what I will say about Everdell is it is so ridiculously beautiful. But that's not good enough. Being beautiful is not anywhere good enough, but it is a world that pulls you into the nth degree. The little creatures in their woodland homes that it's going on, it is absolutely adorable. The art is engaging. The art is, and I happen to think this is the worst of the boxes, but it's still beautiful. And it's just so engaging, especially if you're a fan of Redwall or any kind of, you know, little animal folk things. But past that, the card play in this game is fun. The card play is just, you, you, on your turn, basically, you're going to ultimately play a card or put down a worker. Your workers are essential to get you those resources you need. And playing a card is, well, it's just fun, but you have to pay for the resources on those cards. But then sometimes if you get the right cards, they can cascade off others. It is a game that starts off with you feeling like you will never, ever get all the things done that you want. And it's a game that ends with you feeling that you overstocked your limited tableau of 15 cards with too much junk and you now you have too much stuff and you can't possibly fit all the stuff you want in there. Or in other words, the, the beginning of the game is too little and the end of the game is too much and you have to balance those two. You have to ensure that you go for the perfect system of cards that will ensure you win the game without having wasted resources at the end or just not done enough in the beginning. It is ridiculously rewarding and there's expansion after expansion I've only played with the base so far. There's a lot going on on in this game and I cannot recommend Everdell enough. Like I said, it's my favorite on this list. I'm pretty sure. Yeah, there's like two others here that are really, really up there. From there we have Margraves of Valeria. And I'm realizing that I say from there we have a lot, but I don't really know how to, you know, quickly and smoothly go from one game to the next. But Margraves of Valeria, I just covered Shadow Kingdoms of Valeria. I'll link to that, but they have a Kickstarter going on. Margraves of Valeria, I sadly missed the Kickstarter. I wasn't even aware they had one. I'm a huge fan of Valeria Card Kingdoms. I was not a fan of Villages of Valeria or Quests of Valeria, although I am getting them back to try again based on some comments in my uh, Shadows of Valeria video. So I plan on getting them to get back, trying them again, see how the plays out. But Margraves of Valeria may well be my favorite in the series. For right now, I still like Card Kingdoms better, but Margus has the potential to be my favorite just because it takes the Valeria universe, it takes that fun artwork of Maiko, I think it's Maiko, um, Mihaleo, I can't pronounce his name, I think he started going by Maiko, but he has the art of someone I really, really like, and it has a game system that is fun, it has interweaving interweaving scoring and abilities and everything else it takes it takes the valeria universe and makes it more complicated more complex and thus more rewarding i shouldn't say and thus because sometimes complexity is not necessarily more rewarding but in this case i believe the complexity adds a lot to the game it is a game that it's the first valeria game that i really felt that i had to struggle to do what i wanted but in a good way not so punishing that i feel i can't do things but 
just tough, just tough enough that I really had to plan out which cars I wanted and which pathways I was going to take and management of the shared resources of the universe. They have these soldiers that everyone can access. A lot going on in this game and it is so rewarding. I cannot play, I cannot wait to play it again and now I have to hunt down a bunch of the miniature expansions that I missed in the Kickstarter. From there, let's go to Blitzkrieg. I'll save my favorite two for last. Blitzkrieg, or not my favorite two, Avidel is my favorite. The next two up there are, we'll see. Blitzkrieg is my second favorite two-player game added to this list. It is a tough, tough fight with Watergate. Both of them are thoroughly enjoyable two-player games. Both of them ultimately are just tug-of-war, but then expanded out to actually work. Tug-of-war where even though you're just countering what your opponent did, it really can work in the ecosphere that you're building here. In Blitzkrieg, it, t it takes the it's, the tagline is World War II in 20 minutes, and granted it's not actually World War II, but it's basically fighting on different spheres of battle, fighting on different areas where you're trying to slowly but surely take control so that you can then get the bonuses associated with winning those battles and there are different maps you can play on they have the nippon map which i do highly recommend if you have this game and you haven't gotten the nippon expansion get the nippon expansion it is a whole different way of playing that is just as good different but you know not not better not worse but very very different in terms of how it plays but in this game what you all you're doing is you're just playing various little tiles to slowly move up on one track or, or the next but it works so well because of the rewards of battle because of what happens when you when you dominate a sphere of battle, it really works surprisingly well. All the options you take as you put down a guy, moving a cube along, but also taking the benefit of the location you're in, is an element of worker placement and area control that works ridiculously well. And sure enough, it plays in 20 minutes. So this is a game that I constantly pull out with my wife, basically every single week, get a game or two down, and then we pull it out the next week. I thoroughly enjoy Blitzkrieg. In fact, my wife drastically if my wife were voting this this would be her favorite two-player game uh from this list over here as opposed to for myself watergate i prefer but they are both very very close from there we have genties and this is another one like barbarians that i will have a hard time really talking about eloquently and that's because again like like barbarians there's a lot of different things going on in this game that aren't your typical fare genties is almost a reverse worker placement game it's not a game where you put out workers one at a time but rather you take off these tokens from the board one at a time taking the actions and benefits associated with them and in this game you have a management of a few resources in a way that is ridiculously tight you have to manage your time Time. Different things in the board will take them into L amounts of time and that will affect what you can do in a turn. You have to manage the fact that there are six different villager types, but you can't actually ever have more than seven, I think it's seven, of each of any two pairs. So in other words, while at first you can slowly but surely grow your villagers, at a certain point, any growth will come at the cost of the other one. And you have to manage that, and managing that is important to playing the cards you want, because all these cards you want to acquire during the game and then play require certain balances of villagers, and then some of them will give you rewards on an ongoing basis based on the villagers' types you have. There is so much management of different things in this game. I haven't played it in a while. I really need to get to the table. This is one of those games I played pre-pandemic, which makes any of these games uh, that are on the heavier side, uh, that it's... I, these are games I just haven't gotten to the table in a long time because of COVID-19, because of the pandemic. Genties is a game that I really enjoy. I found it fascinatingly different, fascinatingly interesting, and it's a game that I, I highly recommend giving it a shot if you haven't yet. It is, at least if you like worker placements, if you like tough decisions, if you like those two things, then I do recommend this game. This is basically, like I said, reverse worker placement with a lot of tough decisions and a lot of resource management in different ways. Thoroughly rewarding. From there, speaking of COVID-19, we have Navigator. And if you have played Navigator and you're like, what the hell does that have to do with COVID-19? An excellent question, sir. An excellent, or ma'am, an excellent question, ma'am. Navigator is a game that I owned for going on a year plus by now, but it is a game that I only played for the first time on Yukata.de doing COVID-19. In fact, this copy, while I've played Avocado Navigator two or three times now, I have actually not played it in person even once. Navigator is by Matt Gertz, who I thoroughly enjoy a bunch of his games. I love Antique Duellum. I have not played Antique. I love, love, love Concordia. And now I love Navigator as well. Navigator is, it has a rondelle mechanism. So you're trying to take these actions around a rondelle and it limits the actions you can take. And of course you can sacrifice things to take further actions along that rondelle. There is so much going on in this game, but ultimately it comes down to moving your ships along the board in, in order to access, in order to unlock access to different colonies and slowly increase 
increase your production in those colonies, while then further moving your ships along, slowly but surely unlocking more colonies, more resource types, again while escalating your production or sale of those various resource types, until you eventually get to the end as well and then trigger endgame. A lot going on in this game, but it comes down to balancing the, the trio of, of sale, of production, and of navigation in terms of or earning different bonuses that will ultimately tier and stagger to give you the most rewarding end game you can possibly get. Along the way, there are all these different point modifiers that will allow you to modify the way you score points so that hopefully, if you do it right, if you balance your decisions correctly, you will be able to empower the things you are strong at, which is a mechanic I generally love. Mar Margraves has it. I think there's some other games here, but the, the, I know Margraves has it as well, where different where you, as you t empower certain aspects of the game, the thing you're doing is being self-rewarded for that empowerment. Navigator is a lot of fun. I can't wait to actually play it in person. As of right now, we've just been playing it on Yukata, and it is great. Two games left, two games of these 22, which brings us to Bruges. Now, from these last two, they're both very high up there, but I don't know which one I like more. Bruges is a game that, again, I'm technically cheating on this one. I played this a long time ago, maybe three, four years ago, but got rid of it. I think I played it once and moved on. It is a game that I started playing it again also on Yukata. I have to play this one in person though, but I played on Yukata doing, doing COVID-19 and it has been so much fun. This is a game where you everything you do, it, it comes down to, I'm saying this poorly, in Bruges, what I like about Bruges is every round you draw five cards. Every round you have to you draw up to five. And then every single round you pivot and readjust your strategy based on the cards you drew. Because in this game, the cards are multi-purpose and they allow you to do different things. But the cards also have abilities that are so empowering. And every round you're trying to think through, well, now that I have these five cards, there's three more options of different ways I can pursue a path to victory. It is a game where having a strategy from the beginning is useless versus the ability to, to dynamically pivot every turn as your cards adjust or every turn as your opponents screw you just a bit with the way they take things away from you, take your money, take your workers. There are so many interesting decisions, but it's a game where you have to love changing your plans on the fly. Nothing stays standing in this game. Nothing stays alone. This game is constantly changing around you and it is so much fun as it happens. I love Bruges. I have the expansion here. I've played with almost all the expansion modules. I think the, the boats are practically essential. Bruges, and by the way, again, it's on Yukata. Go ahead, and I believe it's coming, I believe Queen Games also announced that they're doing a reprint, although I love the art of this one, and so we'll see how that plays out. But if you have not given this game a shot, go to yukata.de, play with a bunch of friends, pop up a Zoom meeting. It is so much fun to play this game. I cannot believe, I mean, this is by Stefan Feld, and Castles of Burgundy has historically been my favorite Stefan Feld game. But right now, Bruges comes in neck and neck. I'm not sure which one I would pick if I could only pick one. It is in an incredible experience and I, I I mean I love it. And it plays like an hour every single time. You can just play a few games in a night and just it's it's a lot of fun. Finally, from there we have Vindication, another game that I should not be putting on its side, another game that needs a dusting off. Again, COVID-19 has simultaneously unlocked a lot of games that I play as well as put a lot of games that I used to play out of business temporarily. Vindication is by, I believe, Orange Nebula. And Orange Nebula is fantastic company, by the way. Great customer service. I had an issue with Unsettled that they were able to settle, ironically. Vindication is... <sighs> I don't even know how to explain this. And as a starting point, what I mean by that is when I tried to get my friends to play this game, I explained it to them and immediately realized that I couldn't give a short version of how this game plays without it sounding stupid. So I'll start with the short version and then I'll try to expand from there. The short version of Vindication is that you move your little token around the board trying to collect cubes and you will therefore then be able to turn your cubes into other cubes. As you do so, those cubes can be traded in for cards that will give you abilities and basically you'll hopefully turn cubes into other cubes while getting abilities in the most efficient way possible to win the game. That is actually surprisingly accurate, by the way, but not the most inspiring thing. Now, what I will say about Vindication is, first of all, there is variable endgame scoring. What I mean by that is, every round, every game, you draw two cards that will trigger the, that will cause the, the board stage to trigger what 
ends the game in that game. And then as you slowly get more points, you'll also draw more cards that will add triggers. So at any point, you can draw a card that triggers end game, or at any point, you are slowly adding ways that the game end can be triggered, which is already is a fun concept. From there, those cubes, all that cube stuff I talked about, there are different elements of cubes going on, but you have to manage this resource called your influence. You have things that are in your, you have cubes that start off in your potential, you can move them to your influence, and then eventually you can move them to conviction. But the bulk of the game and the bulk of your cubes will be in your influence, and that is a prime resource that you'll be using for a lot of different things in this game. But one of those things you'll be doing is you'll be trying to put those cubes in various different areas of the board, such as courage, and I don't remember what they are, but different attributes, and then those attributes can be combined into other attributes, and you'll use these things to get different cards on the board that will give you unlock cool abilities. But as you play the game, the board is slowly unlocking around you, and the board state is being defined, and the, the way different elements of the game come together is being defined as you add them to the board, such that you are creating a puzzle. This game is ultimately a puzzle. It is a game where everything you do is really just about how to turn one one cube into another to most efficiently win the game. That is what the game is. But it's a game where you are being presented with a puzzle and you have to fix that puzzle or solve that puzzle. You have to see once the board state is established, once the various buildings are on the board and the various cards around the perimeter are seen and visible and you understand what's going on here, you are now presented with a puzzle of how to most optimally win the game. This is a game that it's almost like Istanbul for grown-ups and Istanbul is for grown-ups, don't get me wrong, but it's a heavier version of Istanbul because Istanbul is also a game that you kind of have to define this puzzle and figure out what's going on here. And now that I'm thinking about it, by the way, Istanbul is actually also should be on this list because Istanbul I also added to my list in 2020. Awkward moment there. I'm not going to run and grab that. But both these games, both Istanbul and Vindication are games that the board state will define the puzzle that you have to solve and you have to then look at it and figure out the optimal way to get there. It is so ridiculously rewarding in Vindication and the variability in this game is off the charts because there are decks and decks of cards and it might not seem like a lot but you only go through a handful of cards in each deck so that having 20-30 cards when you only go through 3 or 4 a game is a lot and from each of those decks has the 20-30 cards and each of those decks you only go through 3 or 4. So. The variability is near endless, and there's expansion module after expansion module, which we haven't even touched upon because we've played this game again and again and again and have barely scratched the surface of what it presents. Vindication is why I backed Unsettled. Not because I know anything about Unsettled or whether I'm confident in it at all, but I am confident that Orange Nebula did a fantastic job with Vindication to such an extent that I'm willing to give them a blind pass on another game, which I might be wrong and I might regret, just for the record. But I love Vindication. I know that the, the overall, I would say, the, the feedback on Vindication is incredibly positive. Overall, is a game that people seem to really like, but... Not everyone, obviously, so do your research, do your due diligence, all that. That is it. That has been a pretty long video with 22 games, or 23 if you count Istanbul. 23 games that I have added to my collection in 2020. There's a lot going on here, a lot of fun, a lot of good stuff, but I play a lot of games. You can expect to see at least a bunch of these on eventual videos where I trade away games because not everything is meant to last. Not everything stays there. Just like, I mean... When you play a video game, when you watch a movie, not everything has to be experienced again. Sometimes the journey is enough. Sometimes the experience of playing a game two or three times, or even just once, sometimes it's enough. They give me happiness, they give me joy, they are fun to play. Some stick around and give me joy and happiness and all that stuff for years on end. Others for a handful of plays and others for just one round of a game if I really, 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 really didn't like it. As usual, I am Alex Ratcliffe. I hope you enjoyed this video. It is slightly different than my usual video just because I usually don't tell you the games I'm keeping. I usually touch upon in other content, but for now I figured something different and it's six months into 2019, and so 2020, geez. It's six months into 2020, and so it's time for something a little different. I hope you enjoyed. I hope, if, let me know, I, I always forget this part, but at the end, let me know in the comments down below which of these games do you like, what games have you added to your collection in 2020, and which of these should I get rid of in my next collection update, which of these am I making a terrible mistake by owning it all, and really should go 100% away. Until next time, I am Alex Radcliffe from Board Game Co. You can subscribe down below, like, share, comment, uh, just, just say hi. Hi. Have a good one.